Well, hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine, and I am president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm also the author of Networking for Nerds. This is a book specifically for you and for me. I'm a huge nerd myself, science nerd, math nerd, the whole shebang. And so this book was written for you specifically in mind as to how you can network as a scientist and an engineer, and quite frankly, how you can market yourself and market your value and communicate your value to potential employers, to potential colleagues, to various people who could have an impact in your career direction and in your science. So today what we're going to be talking about is postdoc career advancement, how to market your value, marketing your value, what does that even mean? And I'd like to thank the American Geophysical Union for sponsoring this webinar as they often do. They hold a number of webinars throughout the year uh, under their AGU Career Center program. And so I just wanted to thank them for their generous sponsorship of this event. A couple of quick housekeeping issues. First of all, if you're having trouble hearing me, please just log out and log back in. You could try using your telephone or your mic and speakers. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. If you're having trouble seeing the screen, you can adjust the viewer. And if the slides are slow, it might be that the internet speed on your computer is slow. So you can go to speedtest.net to check and see what your speed is. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please just type them in the, the question console, the question pane of the console there, and I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. I want to begin by just telling you what our goals are for today, and then I'm going to take a radical change of what I usually do, which is I take questions at the end, but somebody already wrote in a question, and it is fantastic, and it's so great because it relates directly to what the concepts are that we're going to be talking about today in this webinar. So I want to answer that question right away. But before I do, here are our goals for this webinar today which, by the way, is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. And since you are registered, you'll get an email from me telling you when that is actually uploaded. So our goals today are going to be discussing the fundamentals of marketing and self-promotion, how we can identify our value so that we can communicate it to potential employers, to potential PIs. We're going to discuss the foundation, the very core fundamental of marketing, which is communicating our brand, which is our promise of value, via a brand statement. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can craft your own brand statement. We're going to discuss marketing methods and ecosystems and how to market yourself at conferences. And I want to welcome, give a special warm welcome. Of course, I, I know that there are people on this webinar today who are from all over the world and the other 12 or 13 dimensions that exist, that we know exist at least uh, right now. And I want to welcome you all, but I want to extend a very special warm welcome to the postdocs that are on with me today and to congratulate you on your success and to wish you a very happy postdoc appreciation week. Yes, I know that's next week, but I like to get things going fast and early. So congratulations, and uh, I hope you enjoy your postdoc appreciation week because you are appreciated. And this is just one example of how you're appreciated <laughs> in this, in this, during this webinar. So here's the question that came in from, from somebody who's listening today, and it's such a great question, as I mentioned. So I'm going to get right to it because it tells, it really sets the tone for our discussion today. So this person writes in, I have completed my PhD and shifted uh, in uh, this particular state in the United States with my husband. I'm very much interested in applying for a postdoc position. I've tried to contact a few professors through emails, but I'm not getting a positive response. I am very confused how to approach them. Great question. Thank you so much for writing that in. So why is that such an important question and such a fundamental question to answer at the beginning of the webinar as opposed to the end? Because most people when they look for jobs, most people when they apply or are interested in transitioning into a new job, and that goes for postdocs moving into other postdoc appointments, it goes for graduate students looking for postdoc appointments, and it goes for postdocs migrating out of the postdoc into the next phase of their career. Most people look for jobs that are advertised. They look for jobs that have already been established, and then they apply for them. And then what happens is, is they send an email to a professor if you're applying for a postdoc or an academic position, or maybe in industry you would send an email to somebody in, inside the company, and you'd say, can you tell me about this particular job? 
or I'm interested in this job, do you know anybody, or do you know any openings that are available? And when you send an email like that, it makes the other party feel like they are being used. It makes them feel like they you're just trying to get something from them, which in this case you are. You're trying to get a job or get inside information about that job so that you can get that job. And that's not how you build a win-win relationship. That's not how you build a mutually beneficial partnership, which is the foundation for networking and, quite frankly, for self-promotion and marketing as well. And I'm going to give you a definition of what marketing is. So instead of sending emails to professors and saying, hey, do you have any openings in your lab or do you know of any openings in your, in your group, what you should be doing is sending emails to professors and asking for what are called informal conversations or informational interviews and asking them, you know, I really appreciate what you had to say about this in this um, article or I read your article in Nature or Science. I thought it was really interesting for this reason. I'm working on X. I see you're working on X plus one. I think there might be an opportunity for us to collaborate. I think there might be an opportunity for us to contribute to a paper together, to a grant together. In other words, what you do is you're actually, by, by communicating to the other party that you want to help them, you want to contribute to their success and the advancement of their systems, you are marketing yourself. And what you're marketing is that you are a go-getter. You are somebody who wants to contribute value. You're not trying to get something from them. You want to help them with their problems and solve their problems. And then what happens is, by sending emails like that, asking for these informal conversations where we can explore the potential to collaborate and I might be able to help you in some way, that gets you access to hidden opportunities. So this is a very important marketing technique in, in that, the, and the technique is that you send emails asking for appointments to discuss informally how you could potentially work together or to, to explore how you might be able to contribute value to their team. And I know many, many postdocs, and I know many, many scientists who've moved beyond postdocs who've gotten their dream jobs just from doing that. So instead of asking for a job, instead of saying, do you know of any jobs or any openings, you say, you know what, I think I might be able to help you with the paper, or maybe we could collaborate on a project. Would you be interested in talking to me about this in an informal way? Informal, you say the word informal, it shows them that you are not trying to uh, you know, uh, tie them down. You're not trying to go to contract right this moment. You want to literally explore and discuss ideas for partnership, for collaboration. And that marketing technique it technique is a very good way of telling the other party that you want to build a long-lasting relationship with them. That shows them that they would be interested, I would be interested in talking to you because you're not trying to get something from me. So for those of you that are looking to migrate out of the uh, out of your job, which and of course at some point we all will have to do that, we'll all have to change jobs, the way to do it is not to necessarily look for jobs that are advertised, although you should keep all your options open, but more importantly, to look for ways that you can market yourself to potential employers, to potential partners. And then once you have that conversation with them, you can share with them ideas about what you've done and your skills and your expertise. And that's what we're going to talk about more in depth today in this webinar. So thank you so much for, for asking that question right up front because it really did set the great, a great tone for what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to dig for treasure. We are not trying to mine for treasure from or, for, or drill for oil from the other party. We are trying to market ourselves to them so they understand that we could potentially help them. Okay, terrific. So with that in mind, I want you to understand that marketing, the word marketing, the word selling, the word self-promotion, these are not dirty words. Now, Quite frankly, if we were in business school, we would learn on day one, there'd be a number of things that we would learn on day one in business school. We learn about marketing, we learn about selling, we learn that we have to do these things all the freaking time. We would learn that we would have to do self-promotion all the freaking time, not only to promote ourselves, but to promote our organizations, our departments, our teams, our PIs, our vendors, our clients, our colleagues. We would learn that. We would learn that we have to network to build mutually beneficial partnerships. But you know what? I studied math and physics and anthropology, and not once did anybody in any nerd class that I took ever say to me, you know what, Elena, you're going to have to learn how to market yourself if you want to get into graduate school or if you want to get a postdoc or if you want to get a job. 
or if you want to build a career, you have to market yourself. You have to promote yourself. You have to network. Nobody ever said that to me while I was studying topology or calculus or abstract algebra. And so we know that scientists and engineers, we don't necessarily get that lesson. We don't get that lesson to market ourselves. But the irony, the irony is that while we are getting told by uh, our PIs that marketing is dirty, that selling is dirty, you should never sell yourself, guess who is marketing themselves? Guess who is selling themselves? Guess who is self-promoting themselves up the wazoo? It's your PIs, it's your advisors, it's your, your professors. All the people around you that are successful are already marketing themselves. It's really amazing when you think about it. And really the very simplest way of thinking about how your PI is marketing him or herself is when she writes a grant proposal. She is promoting her skills and expertise in X to this granting agency with the idea that they will invest money into her project. That's called sales. That's called marketing. She's not going to tell them in the grant proposal, I suck. My research is stupid and you should never invest in it and I am above selling myself and I'm going to stand on my laurels and you should still give me $5 million. She's never going to say that. Instead, she's going to say, my expertise is in X and Y. We've been able to look at it in this way. We've had successes in this way. And by sharing those successes, she is specifically laying out and spelling out what she has done and marketing herself. And she is suggesting why the granting agency should invest in them and that invest in her and her project. And that is marketing. They, you can't get away from it. So even though your, your colleagues, even though your nerdly advisors and PIs and supervisors within academia and within the postdoc environment are not calling it marketing or selling or self-promotion, you better believe that they're doing that. When they give a talk at a conference, they are marketing themselves. When they write a paper in Nature or Science, they are marketing themselves. You know, even when they sit on a committee, they're communicating their value. They are promoting themselves. So they're doing it already. They're just using different vocabulary. And so you are doing it already as well because you're writing papers and you're giving talks and you're meeting people and you're sitting on committees and so on and so forth. So all these things are part of marketing. And be honest, the, to be honest, the more you do it, the more you engage in marketing activities, strategic marketing activities, the more you will be able to do it better. You will get better at marketing. You'll get better at identifying very specific, appropriate channels for successful return on your investment of the time that you spend in marketing yourself. And the more that you do this, the better you get, the more game-changing career opportunities will come your way. It's really extraordinary. Okay. So fundamental thoughts. You know, also, I want you to be thinking about this. You know, no matter what kind of job you go for, no matter what career you're in, you may be a postdoc right now, you may be going into a postdoc, you may be going into your third postdoc, you may be migrating out of your third postdoc. Wherever you are and whatever sector you're in, you will always be the CEO of you incorporated, or in their case, me incorporated, right? I'm not the CEO of me, I'm the CEO of you. Or you, I'm not the CEO of you incorporated, I'm the CEO of me incorporated, and vice versa. And you know where I'm going with this. And so what I'm trying to say is that you are running a company. You could call yourself a consultant, you could call yourself an entrepreneur, you could call yourself a CEO. It doesn't matter, but the idea is that you have a business, and your business is being a scientist. Your business is doing your area of expertise in an amazing way. And so because you have this business, right, because you are this consultant, you have customers. And your customers consist of a number of different people. It includes your boss, which could be at any phase of your career, your PI, your advisor, your supervisor. It could be actual clients, people who actually give you money. Of course, your boss gives you money, right? They pay you to do work. Uh, but it could be clients outside of the boss, right? So you could be an actual consultant working on a project with an industry partner or with an academic partner where they're paying you. Uh, it could be colleagues. They certainly are customers in that they're, you're delivering value to your colleagues. They could be business partners, people that you are literally in business with, and that could include a granting agency because they're giving you money, they're supporting you, and you're in business with them. And it could include vendors, people and organizations that are providing you resources 
uh, any type of resources from human capital to instrumentation, again, to money, to make your science move forward. And so your job is to think about how you can best market me incorporated to all these different customers so that they understand how you can continuously help them advance in their duties, advance in their mission, and therefore they will want to engage you further. To keep your job and to get your next job, you always have to communicate and amplify your value. There's no way that you can stop. You know, I often talk about when you go for job interviews, when does the job interview actually end? And it's a trick question, right? Because, of course, there's two answers to it. The, the, the formal part of the job interview ends when you and I, have, when I've interviewed you and I've decided I'm going to hire you, and then we agree on a contract. We agree on the terms of the employment. The offer has been extended and accepted by both parties. So that's when the formal part of the interview be, be ends. But quite frankly, the interview never ends. It never ends ever because every day that you come to work, you come in and you have to communicate and amplify your value and demonstrate over and over and over again, essentially interviewing every single day for your job why you are a strategic partner why you are providing value to this organization or to this team or to this PI or to this research group. And you know what, in doing that, what you're doing is you are marketing yourself. You're marketing yourself. So this is just another example of uh, you know, communicating and articulating what it is that you can do. Okay, continuing on. So I want to give you a definition of self-promotion and marketing so that you understand what we're talking about and you see that it is an honorable endeavor it is, uh, it is classy, it is not bragging, it is something that you, like I said, you're already doing, but I want to break it down for you so that you can see how you could even do it better. So what is self-promotion, a.k.a. marketing, a.k.a. selling? First of all, it exists in an appropriate form and ecosystem. This is important because we are not going to go up to somebody and scream in their face at a networking mixer, I am the best geophysicist ever. You should hire me today. That is bragging. That's inappropriate. That's an inappropriate form of promoting yourself. You would not be doing that. So we're looking for appropriate forms and appropriate, appropriate ecosystems. And I'm going to give you some examples in a bit about that. We're authentically and truthfully telling a story about ourselves. This is important, too, because we never embellish the truth. And we want to be authentic. We want to be clear about what it is that we could potentially provide the other party, what it is that we have in our background, in our skill set, in our experience, in our expertise that could help them, right? So that's truthful information. That's authentic information. That's why self-promotion in this regard is not bragging and it is not selling a used car because you are not lying. You are telling the full truth and the full extent of your truth of how awesome you are, but you're doing it in an appropriate form and ecosystem that provides strategic information about yourself, your value, that will encourage me, the other party in this, to make a decision to engage you in some positive manner. And that might be to have a further conversation with you. It might be to in actually hire you or to interview you and then hire you or to ask for your resume and then interview you and then hire you. It could be a number of different things, but it's keeping me engaged to want to learn more so that I can learn more about how you can help me. That is appropriate self-promotion. It's encouraging me to make a decision. So this strategic information that you provide, that you market, that you promote about your authentic and truthful extent, of the extent of your authentic and truthful self, includes your skills, your expertise, your experience, even your pedigree. If you have a specific certificate that you had or you went to a specific school that's very known for X or Y, this is important for you to share. You know, a great example of me doing this myself is when I'm at events and I'm talking to people. And let's say I'm talking to somebody from an oil and gas company and they're saying, you know what, Elena, we really want to, I'm asking them, you know, can you tell me more about what you're working on? Where are you looking to expand your market base right now. And not surprisingly, they say, you know what, we're looking to expand into the Middle East. And I say, oh, that's so interesting. You know, when I was in college, I studied abroad at the American University in Cairo. 
and I took four years of Arabic, including graduate study in Arabic. If I can assist you with anything in that regard, please let me know. Now, what I just did was I promoted myself. I did it in an appropriate form and ecosystem. The ecosystem was the networking mixer. The form was not me saying I'm awesome, but sharing truthful and authentic information about my background. It was strategic in that I wanted to engage them further and see if I might be able to work with them. It provided information about my value. There aren't many mathematic math people who have a math background, a physics background, an anthropology background, who also studied abroad in Cairo and speaks Arabic. At least I did 10 years ago, I should say that. Uh, I still have some of it there. Uh, and it encourages the other party to make a decision because now that I've shared all this extent of my value, now that I've marketed myself to them in this way, they're going to say, really, you do math, you're a nerd, and you speak Arabic? What else do you do? Maybe you can help us. We're looking for somebody with those types of skills. And that causes the other party to engage me in a positive manner. This is what we're talking about. So you see, this is very honorable. There's nothing wrong with this. This is important, and this is extremely classic. The bottom line is self-promotion and marketing is being your own champion. If you don't value your value, nobody else is going to value your value. If, no, if you don't appreciate and show the world how important you are in an appropriate way and how much you value your skills, if you don't champion your own skills and experience and pedigree, then others will not see a value in it themselves. So the first line of marketing defense is showing people Again, in a non-bragging way, in an authentic and truthful and strategic and honorable way, in an appropriate way, that you are a, a champion of your own value, that you highly value what you do for potential customers, and that's why you want to talk to them, because you think that you could potentially help them with their projects. This is not bragging, okay? So, with this in mind, I know some of you who follow me on other webinars have seen this slide before, but those of you who are new to Levine Airlines. I want to just plant this idea in your mind because this is a very important part of marketing too. When we're marketing ourselves, when we're promoting ourselves to others, when we're trying to get that next postdoc or when we're trying to get a position as a faculty member or a position in industry or a nonprofit or an NGO or whatever, we have to make sure that we understand what the fundamental purpose of any job is because then we can orchestrate and flexibly change our marketing materials to adjust them to target specific areas of what that job needs, or what those job needs are. Now, the purpose of any job in any organization, in any sector, in any part of the known universe is to solve problems. So when I hire you into my postdoc, as a postdoc in my lab, or when I hire you as a professor, or when I hire you as a president, I'm hiring you to solve problems. So the fundamental aspect of your marketing strategy is to show me how you solve problems. It is to ask me what problems I need solved and share with me information about how you solve problems and how your problem solving abilities can help me solve my problems in unique and innovative ways. That is the core piece of marketing, okay? Now there's a connection in, in your communication, in your, in your marketing, between these three things. And I just want to just quickly go over these things for those of you who, are, who haven't seen this before. So I've mentioned value, but I want to tell you what a brand is because we know brands. AGU is a brand. Quantum Success Solutions is a brand. Coke is a brand. Pepsi is a brand. Uh, there's lots of brands out there. They have both positive connotations and some have negative connotations. We want to always make sure that our brand, the brand that represents me incorporated, is a positive brand and a brand is simply a promise of value it's your promise of value it's your promise to deliver excellence dependability and expertise in whatever it is that you do okay dependability expertise and excellence in whatever it is that you do that is your promise of value that is your brand so you have a brand and what happens is, is if you promote your brand appropriately if you market your brand appropriately it becomes amplified by your reputation, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And then people start to get intrigued. They want to learn more about your brand. They want to learn more about how your promise lives up. Because promises are about expectations. And if I engage you once and I see your excellence, I'm going to expect 
that that excellence is going to happen the next time and the next time and the next time. And that's going to want me to engage you further. So as you market yourself, you're marketing your brand. And I'm going to tell you how to actually communicate that brand in a moment. Now, another piece of this trifecta is your attitude, which is your calling card of your brand. It's how you communicate your brand. And it's very important because if people see that you are excited and energetic and enthusiastic and polite and appropriate in ecosystems, right, in how you communicate your brand, then they're going to see that your attitude is a high-level good attitude, and they're going to want to learn more about your brand. But the, the unfortunateness about brands and about attitudes is that your attitude can not only, on the positive side, open the door for somebody to want to learn more about your brand and what you can do for them, right? That's marketing. But it could also potentially market you in a bad way. So a bad attitude could tell somebody how you could potentially sabotage their organization or could potentially lead them down a wrong road. If you have a bad attitude, they're going to jump to the conclusion that your brand is bad and they're not going to want to engage you and the doors are going to be closed. You might not even know that the doors of those opportunities even exist. So people say attitude is everything because I can teach you how to be successful in geosciences. I can teach you how to be a successful scientist. I can teach you how to be a successful postdoc and how to do your job correctly. I can teach you all those technical skills. But what I cannot teach you is how to have a good attitude, how to work well with others, how to bring out the best in people and yourself, and how to market yourself appropriately so people want to learn more and engage you and engage your group as well. Right? And so this is very important. Now, as you're promoting your brand through your attitude, it becomes amplified via your reputation. And your reputation is your most important asset. It's not what you know. It's not uh, who you know. It's what people know about what you know. That is your most important asset. So your reputation is what people know about your brand and your attitude. And that is marketing 102. So we're talking about marketing 101 today. Marketing 102 is your reputation does the marketing work for you. And as you develop uh, your skills in marketing and as you communicate your brand and your attitude in a different uh, ecosystems and events and through different ways, what you find is that your reputation is going to become a carrier. It's going to carry your brand and attitude to people, to places, to nooks and crannies in the ether in the organizations within your field, within your subfield, even beyond that, to places and people who have the potential to engage you and want to engage you because they're learning about your reputation. So your reputation you have to guard with your utmost confidence and your utmost attention because what people say about you and what people know about you will also open doors for you and will help you to advance in your career and advance your your research group's um, opportunities as well. So you brand yourself as a leader in your field. Your attitude tells that story. Your reputation carries that story to other people. And this is how you're able to get other opportunities. So your goal in branding, in attitude development, in reputation amplification, in marketing your abilities is to become a known quantity. We want to become a known quantity in the community known for delivering value and innovative solutions, for being resourceful, for connecting people with others, we want to always be seen as a connector, and for looking to contribute value rather than take. Now again, going back to the idea that you always need a job, I know you need a job, I know you need money, you do need things, but if you're known more so as somebody who wants to contribute and help others, this is where you, if you market yourself in that way, this is where opportunities can come your way. So this is where instead of sending emails to professor after professor after professor asking for jobs, asking for opportunities, you're sending emails to professors saying, I read your article. I think it's amazing for these reasons. I'd like to talk to you how I might be able to help you. I'm working on this or I have expertise in this instrument. I might be able to assist you. Why don't we have a conversation? And you know, let me give you a quick story of this exact thing happening with a postdoc and how this postdoc got their job. So this person was a grad, wrote about this story in an article for Science Magazine. This person is a, was a graduate student and they had expertise in nanotechnology. That was their expertise in nanotechnology. 
they were really interested. This person was really, really interested in working in a lab, working in a research group where he could leverage his expertise in nanotechnology to develop medical devices. But he had no knowledge of medical devices. He was not in medical devices at all. And this was just not his field. But he really wanted to work in this field. And he really realized that with his expertise in nanotech, he could potentially reach out to people who were medical device experts and tell them about what he could potentially do for them. So he did literature searches. He started reading papers, people that had written papers. He was reading their papers. Of course, he was reading their marketing documents. He was looking at talks that were given on medical devices. And he started identifying a number of people within the field of medical device development and engineering that he thought he could potentially help. And he reached out to them. And in particular, he reached out to this one professor at a university. And he said, you know what? I read your paper. I think it's interesting. I see what you're trying to do. I think I can help you. I have this expertise in nanotechnology. I'd like to move into the medical device space. And I can help you with the nanotech side if you would be interested in helping me with the medical device side. And she, the professor, was extremely intrigued by that offer. He was offering to assist her, of course, in, in, uh, in exchange for him, her assisting him. But he was offering to assist her. And you know what? That turned into a conversation which turned into an interview, which turned into a job offer for a postdoc appointment that did not exist. He created his own postdoc appointment by communicating how he could potentially help this professor with her work in an innovative way, in a way that no other person who had, she had come in contact with had done so. That is an amazing marketing technique. He, he got the job. He's in an amazing place right now. And she got a great uh, you know, deal out of it as well because she learned all of this expertise in nanotechnology and was able to move her medical device research into a new direction, into a new dimension. This is the kind of marketing we're talking about, okay? So what we're going to do, and I'm going to send you a copy of this, by the way, a skill inventory matrix. We're looking to identify what are our skills. So we have a number of different skills. We have scientific and engineering skills. We have business skills that we can share with people when we're marketing ourselves. One of those skills that we have is marketing and sales, right? Because we've written papers, we've given talks, we've, we've uh, written uh, brand proposals. We have soft skills that we have, and we even have characteristics about ourselves which we can identify. And what we do is we, we go through the different experiences that we've had, and we identify those things, and we use this data, we use this information about ourselves, about our skills. Our, our, our technolo technological and scientific skills, our business skills, our soft skills, and the characteristics that we've recognized in ourselves from these opportunities to start building a value statement or a brand statement, or if you want to call it a 30-second commercial or an elevator pitch. And you've heard all these terms, and really what these are, basically, I want to communicate and articulate and market my value to you very quickly in such a way that will engage you will encourage you to engage me in a positive manner. So how do we develop this value statement? And like I said, these are all the same phrases for the same item. I'm going to use them interchangeably. So why do I even need a value statement? I need to communicate what I'm talented in. I need to articulate the benefit that I'm going to provide you. I need to convince others why they would want to partner with me, whether it's for a job or an internship or a fellowship or a grant or even just a collaboration or a paper that we're going to write together, uh, I want to entice you to learn more about me. Really, that's what I'm doing. When I'm marketing myself to you, when I'm sharing with you my expertise in Arabic and math, I'm enticing you to learn more, to want to learn more about me, right? I'm giving you the trailer. The movie is Elena, but I'm giving you the two-minute trailer or the 30-second trailer so that you'll want to go see the movie, so you'll want to learn more about the movie, Elena in 3D, okay? So the value statement includes your unique blend of skills and experience and expertise, your problem-solving abilities, and maybe even a tale or two about a problem that you've solved that's similar in nature to what I might be looking for in a problem solver, your overarching goals. This is important to me because I need to see parallels between your overarching goals and my goals. It's not just about what it is that you can do for me. It's how what you can do for me 
how that relates to what you want to do for yourself. Because if I don't see that there's an investment, if I see that you just want to uh, contribute, but it doesn't relate to your overall career goals or your overall professional goals, I'm not going to want to invest in you in bringing you into my team and bringing you into my research group as my postdoc or into my department as my professor or bringing you into my team on the industry side either. I need to know that there are parallels because since I am investing in you, I'm investing time and money and resources, I need to know that you are going to be in it for the long haul. So your goals should parallel what my goals are. And that's what this that postdoc that I just mentioned to you a few moments ago, the nanotech expert did. He made sure to articulate that not only was he interested in helping this professor of medical device technology advance her research in medical devices, but he was also really interested in medical devices himself. That was an area he wanted to get into, and he felt that nanotechnology was a good and strong platform for that. And so as a result, she saw not only could he help her, but that there would be a relationship between them because their goals were the same. They both had an interest in medical device technology. You also want to demonstrate and share the benefit that you provide the other party, which is essentially your value and your competitive advantage. Your competitive advantage is those, those skill sets that you have that other people might not have, right? Not many, again, going back to my example, not many math majors study abroad in Cairo, Egypt. So that is a competitive advantage that I have and that I have too. So as you build your value statement, you want to think about what problems do I solve? For whom do I solve them? In other words, who's the customer? And what outcomes do I propose? What are the audience, who are the audiences? There's going to be multiple audiences. When you are trying to market yourself, you have to be nimble to communicate your, your expertise to multiple audiences. So if your audience is a potential boss or a collaborator, you're going to be communicating your value in one way. If it's for a fellowship or an internship or an award that you're applying for, you're going to be communicating and marketing yourself in a different way, using different vocabulary. If it's for an informal interview or an in, informal informational interview or informal conversation with somebody that might lead to a job later, you're going to be marketing something else and you're going to be using different words, different terms, and different ways of, of, uh, of different avenues of sharing your information. And it might be also that you are always, since you're always marketing, right, you're always networking, you're always communicating and looking for opportunities, you might end up talking with a stranger, right, somebody on the airplane, somebody on the train, somebody on the grocery line store, uh, the line at the grocery store, and this stranger who could have access to hidden opportunities, they need to know what you're valuable, what you are valuable in as well. You know, a great example of this is a good friend of mine. She used to work at a coffee shop. She has a background in science. And um, she, uh, but she was working at a coffee shop early in her career, and um, every day she had customers that came in, and they got to know her, and she got to know them. And, by having such a great attitude while she was just delivering coffee, just serving coffee, they wanted to see her more and more. And they would request her as the person who gave her the coffee, and they looked forward to seeing her. And they engaged her in conversation. Her attitude was infectious. It was such a good attitude. And in the conversations that she had with people, she would talk to them about how she was interested in science, and she had a master's degree in physics, and, and she was a teacher, and she, she, you know, she was a nerd, and she was really interested in science teaching. And then, you know, as, as she continued conversing with these, uh, with these quote unquote strangers, with these uh, people that would come into the coffee shop, you know, she got to know them just as much as they got to know her. And one of them ended up being on the board of a very prestigious high school in the city in which she was living. And he said, you know what, we're about to hire a science teacher. Would you be interested in applying for the position? And he was able to shuffle her resume to the top of the pile, and she ended up getting the job because she worked at a coffee shop, because she was marketing herself to these strangers via her attitude and also in sharing with them what she was interested in. In addition to coffee, she was interested in science and science teaching, and they were able to give her access to hidden opportunities. So that's why you want to always have your marketing cap on, always, because there's always people there around you that are potential quote unquote strangers, but could potentially open doors for you to hidden opportunities that they themselves control or that people that they know control. And so we also want to think about what the ecosystem is that we're delivering our value statement in 
it's correspondence by email and phone, if it's on social media, if it's in person, or if it's via a formal job interview, each one is, is going to dictate different ways of speaking, different things that you're going to bring up, different uh, comp concepts you're going to address, and even different problems that you're going to discuss that you've solved. So what do, we, what do we include in our value statement? We're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to discuss our experience, our major field of study, and any relevant work experience. We're going to state a strength or a skill that they might be interested in. We're going to follow that off with an accomplishment or two that proves that you have that skill. Um, we're going to describe our goal. And most importantly, we're going to tell them how we can immediately benefit them. So here's the template. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm a postdoc. I'm a graduate student. I'm an undergrad. I'm a graduate of the University of Arizona's Geosciences Department, and my expertise is in economic geology. Uh, I have experience doing X and Y. I did an internship with this particular company where I was able to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I've also studied abroad in Cairo where I learned Arabic and created an honor society for students at the American University in Cairo where I was able to recruit, I was able to market, I was able to use social media. And what I'm looking for is an opportunity where I can use these skills. Um, and this is where now, the next part of this is the punchline. This is where you tell me what you can do for me. And that's what marketing is all about. What can you do for me? So the kinds of phrases that you're going to employ in your value statement are going to be things like, I could be potentially I could be of immediate benefit to your organization because of my expertise in this. Or I'd like to explore the potential to partner with you for these reasons. Or I could see there might be an opportunity to collaborate because or in this way. Or perhaps we can explore writing a grant proposal or a paper together or something very uh, solid. So these are the kinds of things that you leave in your value statement and you end your value statement with. And let me tell you, when you do this, it opens doors for you. It gives you access to hidden opportunities, and it even allows you, like that postdoc in nanotechnology and medical device technology, to create opportunities for yourself. This is your time to shine. You are not out to get something. You are out to give something. This is the key. Okay? This is the key. So I want to give you some examples of brand statements, of value statements, and I specifically picked value statements that are not in geosciences. They are not even in science, although there's one set that I'm going to give you is in engineering, because I wanted you to see how other people in other professions promote themselves, market themselves via their 30-second commercial, via their value statement. So Lois Creamer, who is a professional speaker and who books speakers, her value statement is I work with speakers who want to book more business, make more money, and avoid costly mistakes. Now, I love that because it gets straight at the heart of the matter. Yes, it could be a little bit longer, but it's short, it's sweet, it's to the point, it articulates what it is that she can do for me. She's going to help me book more business. She's going to help me make more money. She's going to help me avoid costly mistakes. This is somebody who I probably want to talk to. Now, Mark A. Roosevelt, who's also a trainer, he says that his he, he, his uh, value statement is, I work with clients to hone their public speaking and creative thinking skills. Also very short and sweet. I think it could actually be improved. I think he should say how he could do that, or he should add something about how long he's been in this business. Maybe he could say something more specific about what creative thinking skills he's talking about. This would be useful. So I wanted to give you some, some quick examples of, of value statements that people use. Now, here's another case study that I wanted to present for you. This is a brand statement case study. Uh, this is a series of value statements delivered for different audiences. So a good friend of mine is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Arizona. And uh, that's my alma mater. And uh, he is uh, an expert in uh, certain areas of electrical engineering, and he's also a professor of surgery in the medical school, and his expertise is developing training modules and training tools, robotic training tools, that will help to educate doctors who are in training, so physicians in training in medical school, how they can do robotic surgery. So this is his area of expertise. So I asked my friend, can you tell me, give me about five examples of your brand statement, of your value statement, how you would deliver and market yourself, how you deliver your brand 
how you communicate your brand, how you would market yourself to multiple audiences, depending on what the audience is, if you even know, right? Because you don't necessarily know who the audience is, and I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. Okay, so hold on to your seat for that one. So in the first place, I said, all right, Yerzy, how would you, that's his name, Yerzy, how would you introduce yourself? How would you share your value statement to somebody on an airplane, right? This is a stranger. You don't necessarily know what their academic or scientific or engineering background is. So how would you introduce yourself? And he says, I build surgical systems that make operations such as gallblacks, gallbladder, or appendix removal safer for patients. They help you recover faster with much less pain. Again, go straight to the heart of the matter. It's light on the technical details. It's not dumbing it down, but it's light on the technical details because he doesn't know who that person is yet. He hasn't had a conversation with them in depth to learn how much technology or, or engineering expertise they might have. But this is a great way to start the conversation because everybody can relate to this. Everybody knows somebody who's had an operation and who wants to recover faster with much less pain. And as a result of him saying that, I'm going to say, really, how do you do that? So he has now engaged me, and he's enticed me to want to learn more, to ask more questions. He was strategic about it. He was terrific in marketing himself. Now, for a potential investor, maybe somebody who would invest in his technology, he can go into a little bit more detail about the technology and about what the investment would mean. And he would say something like, I design surgical training simulators and surgical guiding systems, which will revolutionize the way we train students and medical residents and the way robotic surgery will be done in the next decade. Again, as an investor, as somebody who's going to put money into this enterprise, this is something I need to know and is useful. This is a great marketing technique. For a potential partner in academia who doesn't necessarily have a scientific background, he's going to talk about things that they would find important like teaching and research. So he says, I teach and research methods and techniques that integrate high technology in medicine, especially surgery. I focus on how to make surgical tools and training more effective using computer-based assistive tools. So this is important for somebody in academia to learn because you know what? Wow, you do this, you're teaching this, and you're researching it. Why don't we have a conversation? Because I'm interested in developing computer-assisted tools as well. Again, he's marketed himself appropriately to entice the other party to learn more. Uh, for a potential partner who has an engineering expertise, he's maybe going to go into a little bit more detail about the software and the hardware, co-design, the application focus. He's going to go into details and give the technological expertise. And then for somebody who is definitely in computer engineering, right, who understands the technical jargon of his subfield, now he's going to get into really nitty-gritty details. So he's going to say something like, my new haptic and augmented reality guidance system for minimally invasive surgery will complement your work in medical simulation well. So he is talking in their language. He's using their vocabulary. But he's still doing the same marketing. He's still doing the same marketing tactic, which is trying to entice me to learn more so that I will want to engage him further. So what I want you to keep in mind when you're building your value statements is that you know, a lot of people think that you're going to deliver your value statement in one shot. You're going to introduce yourself to somebody at a party, at a mixer, at the AGU fall festival, festival <laughs> at, the, at the AGU fall meeting, and uh, boom, you're going to deliver it, and that's going to be the end of it, and then you can walk away. You've done your marketing for the year. Congratulations. But that's not how it works. Your brand statement cannot, may not, may be delivered in one shot, or it could be delivered over the course of a conversation. As more information is revealed about the other party, you will adjust your brand statement to incorporate and introduce new information into the statement, into the conversation. This is really effective marketing. This is strategic marketing in learning, as you're conversing with the person, you're learning what it is that they find interesting, what they hold to be of value, and you are incorporating information that they would find value as well. Okay, that's important. So you're not going to necessarily deliver it all in one shot. But you do need to be prepared to stand by it and be prepared to follow up. If you say you speak Arabic, and they, I guarantee you, they will turn around and start speaking to you in Arabic. So make sure you qualify that by saying, I spoke Arabic, I took Arabic for four years, I'm not, I haven't spoken it in a while, but if I needed to, I could learn it again or I could brush up on it. So that you're being totally honest about your expertise. 
So be nimble, be flexible. Change it for different audiences. Stand by it. Uh, in other words, be a champion. Um, keep it simple. Keep it short. That's called KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple and short. And practice, practice, practice. Because the more you practice, the easier it will get to promote yourself, to market yourself, to deliver this, this marketing strategy or this marketing tactic, which is just one tool in your marketing arsenal. Now, I wanted to give you some ideas about how you can best market yourself, some methods and ecosystems in which you can market yourself to get that opportunity, to get that postdoc, to communicate to other postdocs how you could help them in their work. So certainly by writing, but not just the papers in your field, and not just in the journals in your subfield, but write articles and blogs and letters to the editors and op-eds in magazines, in publications, on websites that are going to be seen by people in your field who would see another side of your expertise, another side of your skill set. You know, a great example of that, you're a member of AGU, right? And if you're not, you got to join today. Uh, but you're also probably a member of many other professional societies, and every single one of them have newsletters and publications that they produce. You could write a letter to the editor for EOS, which is AGU's publication. You could write an article for EOS. You could write an article for their website, for their blog. This is things that they, the professional societies welcome their members to do. You have access to do that, and it'll give you a great marketing uh, platform to promote yourself to potential colleagues. And I can tell you from myself, from writing articles, from uh, participating in interviews with journalists where they write the articles about me, even in uh, what appear to be, it's not the New York Times, but it's you know the newsletter of this professional society or this particular blog, I've gotten opportunities. People have reached out to me and said, Elena, I'd like to talk to you about what you do. So this is very important. These are important marketing techniques, okay? Speak. Don't just speak at conferences, which are very important, but speak at your institution. If you don't have a, uh, a journal club, create one. If you know you're going to be traveling to a new city, offer to speak at a colloquium in that city at that university. You let people get to know you. You know, I wrote an article for Science Magazine a few years ago called Marketing Your Value, I think, for postdocs, uh, which is where I got this original idea from. You can take a look at it, and I'm going to send you a link to it as well. And, you know, one of the stories that I highlighted was about this scientist who was from Greece. She got her uh, undergraduate in Greece, PhD in Heidelberg, postdoc at Yale, always had a goal of going back to Greece for her permanent position, for a permanent job. And what she did to facilitate that was essentially develop a marketing campaign. She didn't call it that because she's not in business. She's a scientist. But what she did was every time she knew she was going back to Greece, she reached out to Greek universities and said, can I come and give a colloquium? And pretty soon she was getting invitations at other universities. And pretty soon she was having, she, when she'd go back, she'd have meetings with people. And all these engagements that she was doing when she went back and, in, and stayed in touch as well were marketing techniques and tactics. And she was so successful with this that by the time she finished her postdoc at Yale, and was ready for an opportunity, there was an opportunity waiting for her in Greece at an institution that needed somebody with her specific area of pharmacogenetics, I think it was what her area was. They had created a new opportunity. It wasn't created just for her, but they created an opportunity in this area of biosciences, and she had established herself as the expert in Greece in this area of biosciences. They knew she needed a job. They had a job to fill, i.e. they had problems that needed to be solved. They immediately thought of her because she had marketed herself so innovatively and successfully. She had established herself as a known quantity in the community, in the region. They were, she was the only one they thought of for the job, basically. And she got it. And she got the job in one of the worst economic crises in Greek's history, in recent history. That says a lot about marketing. This is the kind of marketing that can get you results. This is what I want you to be excited about, okay? So we want you to write, we want you to speak, we want you to volunteer for professional societies and chapters and organizations within your own institution so people can see you, they can see your expertise, and they can. Say there's a spotlight shining on you so they get a chance to see your skill set. We want you to attend conferences and events strategically. We want you to volunteer for committees, 
apply for awards, and then when you get the award, let people know you got the award. Tweet it out. Put it on your LinkedIn profile. Put it on your CV. Let people know. Send thank you notes to people who wrote letters of recommendation. Or reach out to that advisor who you haven't talked to in a couple of years and say, hey, Dr. Levine, guess what? I wanted to let you know I won the Nobel Prize this year, and I couldn't have done it without you. I hope you can join me in Scandinavia in December. So let people know about these things. Remember, we're not bragging. We are classy scientists, and classy scientists do not brag. We champion our value. We strategically market our abilities to other parties. That's what we do, and that's what we're doing with these methods. So we're also going to leverage social media by being active on LinkedIn and Twitter, Facebook as well. And we're going to look to be an advocate. How can I help you? Oh, you want to meet somebody at Microsoft? Well, you know what? My brother-in-law is Bill Gates. Let me introduce you. Oh, you want to meet somebody at Chevron? You're interested in oil and gas? You know what? My good friend works as the environmental consultant for Chevron. Let me introduce you. Let me advocate for you to get you the opportunity that you want. The more you do that, the more opportunities come your way and the way of your organization and research too. A couple of marketing techniques for conferences, specifically for the AGU fall meeting, but quite frankly, for any conference you go to. First of all, have business cards. You don't need one with a picture on it. You're not a real estate agent. If you're a real estate agent, then you put your picture of yourself on your business card. But if you are a scientist, you don't need to do that. Your business card can be very simple, just your name, your email address, your phone number, who you are, in other words, PhD candidate, postdoc, in, and then give me, tell me what it is that you are a postdoc in, right? You're a postdoc in economic geology at the University of Arizona. Give me three phrases to describe your subfield so I know who you are. That's an effective marketing technique because when you give me the card, I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, ah, you know X, Y, and Z. You know what? It's so amazing that you're here. We actually need somebody to help with Z and Z plus one. Do you think you would be interested in having a conversation about that? Boom. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, and then what we want to do at conferences is if we're giving a talk, if we're giving a poster, we want to promote it. So we're going to invite people to attend ahead of time. We're going to market it on our business card. We're going to put a sticker on the back of our business card that says the title, the name, obviously the title, the name, the, the title, the date, the time, and the location of the poster of the talk so that when I meet you at the icebreaker, when I meet you at the networking function, when I sit down next to you at the talk and we're chatting briefly, I can give you my business card and I can say, hey, look at the back of my business card. Here's when my poster is going to be. Please come. I would love for you to see my poster or I'd love to see you. I'd love to have you um, see my talk. And I'm going to also market my talk and my poster on bulletin board. So I'm going to print out, before I go to the conference, I'm going to print out a quick little poster, a mini poster that I'm going to put on a bulletin board. And I'm going to tweet out when my talk and my poster is so that people can come. I'm going to go to special events like the icebreaker, like the networking luncheon, like town halls and other events like that so that I can network. Remember, networking and self-promotion and self-marketing are all tied together. Okay? I'm going to volunteer at the conference so people get a chance to see me. And I'm going to mosey through and introduce myself at the exhibit hall, in the poster farm, at the talks, at the town halls, at the networking events. Because every time you open your mouth, quite frankly, you are marketing yourself. You are creating an opportunity where somebody could potentially hire you in the future. And that's very exciting. So in conclusion, you are quote unquote marketing and self-promoting and selling yourself every single freaking day. And this is nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. You have to do it. You have to build it up strategically. You have to do it more advanced. In other words, you have to think strategically about it, how you communicate your brand, your value, a promise of value to decision makers so that you can help them understand how you can solve their problems. You need to be prepared to market me incorporated for the rest of your professional life. And what happens is the more you do that, the more hidden opportunities come your way, the more opportunities you're able to create for yourself as a postdoc and beyond the postdoc. And this is really, really exciting stuff. A couple of uh, notes before I take some questions. Uh, we're doing one more webinar this year. OMG, you guys, I'm so excited. 
AGU Career Center is going to host one more webinar on uh, November 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on poster presentation success. This is where we're going to talk about how to build a successful poster, how to design a successful poster, and then how to leverage the networking problems, networking opportunities associated with having that poster. So it's not just how to design a cute poster, it's how to build that poster and make it successful and then leverage the networking opportunities that come with having that, that uh, poster. And then I also want you to run, run right this second. Well, wait, wait two seconds before I end. But in two seconds after I'm done, run to your computer, right? Run to your computer, register for the AGU fall meeting. That's fallmeeting.agu.org. Register now, register to attend special events. I'm going to be there giving career workshops, a career Q&A, one-on-one -on -one career consultations, my goodness, if it has the word career in it, I'm probably going to be there. And I'm going to be helping with the networking luncheon, too. And I want to work with you and help you at the conference, too. So I want to thank you so much. As always, it is a privilege and an opportunity to work with AGU and to work with you, you amazing rock stars out there, to help you better market yourself so that you feel confident that you are a champion of your value. You see how amazing you are. We know you're the best looking. We know you're the sexiest audience out there. But we also want to share and market that you are the most brilliant, talented, skilled scientists and engineers out there, too, who can get the job done, who can solve problems in innovative ways. And this is where the marketing is going to come in. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And one marketing plug for me, if you enjoyed this talk today, I talk a lot about marketing. I talk a lot about self-promotion in my new book, Networking for Nerds. It is available to buy right this second. So in two seconds, run to your computer and buy it if you want. Uh, and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Buy it, but I'm, I'm also kidding. Uh, but I think you will enjoy it as well because it's specifically about um, networking and marketing and self-promotion techniques for scientists and engineers. So with that, thank you so much. I'm going to stick around. We have, a, we have about... Well, we're over by two minutes, but you know me. I'm going to stick around and answer some questions uh, for a few minutes. If you have to go, don't worry. We recorded this. This will be uploaded soon. And thank you so much. And I'll see you at the next webinar. And I'll see you in San Francisco at the AGU Career Center, uh, at the AGU Fall Meeting at the Career Center. So let me ask, answer some questions now from some people. And they were very, very patient. We have a number of questions here. Um, somebody asked... Uh, they asked, um, can I email a professor again? So this was the same person who asked that wonderful question at the beginning of the webinar, right? I've tried to connect with uh, professors. I've sent them emails, but I'm not getting a positive response. How do I approach them? So this person asked a follow-up question, great follow-up question. Can I email those professors again with a proposal as suggested by me? So I don't think there's anything wrong. If you have not heard back from these professors, you can email them again, introduce new information like, hey, I just saw your paper, or hey, I saw you're going to be speaking at this conference, or you spoke at this conference. I think that's really interesting. This is what I'm interested in, too. And I think there might be an opportunity to collaborate. Why don't we have a conversation about it? Could we have a 20-minute phone appointment to discuss it? This is what I think I can assist you with. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The, the worst possible response is not going to be, no, get the heck away from me, stop stalking me, as, unless you are stalking them. But you're not going to do that because you're a classy scientist. The, the worst possible thing would be that they would ignore you, and that might be just because they're really busy. So that's why you want to go for quantity as well as quality. Great question. Somebody asked this question. I'm currently working as a postdoc. My husband also wants to get some work um, I just want to know, I just want to ask you, what is the appropriate way to ask for a job which could meet the academic requirements based on the background and also meet the goal of getting something close to my place? I would really appreciate it if you can suggest what is the trick to ask for some job in a professional manner. So another really good question. And it sounds like you're asking for two questions. It sounds like you're asking, how do I ask for a job for my partner, for my husband? Um, and also, how do I ask for a job um, in general? So uh, the, in answer to the first question, how do I ask for a job for, for my significant other, for my partner, um, you would, uh, first of all, I would get myself settled. And so if you are already in a postdoc, that's good. 
Um, and then you could uh, potentially bring up the idea that you have your significant other, they're an expertise in X, and you want to see maybe there's an opportunity for them to work here as well. Is there, what do you have, do you have any recommendations? So instead of saying, can you get my husband a job, or do you know of any jobs, you can say, what are your recommendations for finding an opportunity or for landing an opportunity uh, for my husband since we want to live in the same city? That's an, that's an option. And by the way, there's a really great article written um, in Science Magazine that's written by a, two, uh, that by a couple, an academic couple, who argued, uh, they argued when in the interviewing process should they bring up about the two-body problem, right? When should they bring up that I want a job from both me and my husband? And um, they argued pro, uh, for, so they pro argued for and against uh, the bringing it up before the interview, so during the actual application process, for and against during the interview, and for and against during the negotiation, so after one offer has been extended. And it's a really great article, so if you want to Google that, you can. And if you can't find it, you can send me an email about it. Um, as far as your second part of your question, which is how do I ask for a job, uh, the idea is that you don't ask for a job for yourself. You never ask for a job. You ask for an opportunity to discuss the, the chance to work together or to see how you could potentially collaborate or to um, suggest that there might be an opportunity to partner in some way. And that will lead to, that could potentially lead to a job. And I know for many of you, you feel desperate because you, you're about to graduate, your postdoc appointment's about to end, your contract's about to come to a conclusion, and you need a job ASAP. And I know that you feel desperate, but I don't want you to feel desperate. And, and people don't, people that you're engaging, they don't want to feel that you're desperate either, right? Because then they're going to feel like you're just trying to use them. But if you come at them with a different point of view, how can I help you? And in doing so, I might be able to work with your team that's going to get you the access to the jobs that you want. So there are actually quite a few more questions here, and we are out of time. But as I mentioned, I'm going to be writing up a companion article about this um, webinar that will be posted on the AGU Career Center website. It will answer these questions at that, at that time, and I will send you an email about that when that's posted. This recording will be posted on YouTube as well and on the, uh, on the AGU's website. And Finally, lastly, I thanked you already, but I want to congratulate all the postdocs out there, let you know how much I appreciate all the hard work that you are doing. Congratulations on National Postdoc Appreciation Week next week. I hope you have a wonderful week this week and next week, and I hope all of your colleagues appreciate your value in everything that you do every day, because you deserve that. You deserve to be valued in every ecosystem in which you work. So thank you all so much. What a privilege, what an opportunity. What a, I am so appreciative of it, and I wish you the very best. And this concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much.